Well, let's take a look at sedimentary processes. And those are things that happen to sediments. And sediments are really just the loose, unconsolidated rock that can be formed from the earth itself or organisms can form it. And we'll talk a lot more about that uh, in next week's lecture. But there are lots of processes that go on on the shelf that create and destroy sediments and rock and we want to talk a little bit about that. Um, there's also sediments that accumulate in oceanic trenches that give rise to some features uh, and also just oceanic processes themselves. The biological activity in the deep ocean or in the surface waters of the ocean cause a rain of materials down on those uh, ocean basins creating a sort of fluffy sort of soft feature to the ocean basins. Now, the goal here is really just to introduce these as ideas and to get you to start thinking about how the seafloor is altered in, in terms of um, what it looks like and, and the kinds of sort of weathering processes that go on in the undersea ocean. It isn't to be comprehensive with this or to go into a great amount of detail, but just to, again, make you introduce to you some alternate activities or the kinds of processes that go on that shape the bottom of the seafloor. As I said before, submarine canyons are like mudslides that you might see in Laguna Beach or Malibu. And when these sediments build up, they can suddenly, when it builds up enough, it can suddenly get set loose, perhaps by an earthquake, and these sediments rush down the side of the continental slope and carve it out. And as they carve it out, um, they carry more material with it, and eventually all that stuff kind of piles up on the bottom of the ocean. Well, because heavier sediments pile up first, the larger particles we find on the bottom, and then the finer particles on top of that. And after several episodes of that, we get large particles, fine particles, large particles, fine particles, large particles, fine particles, in what are called tur turbidity deposits or turbidites. And here's an example of one from Point Lobo State Reserve, one of my favorite places to visit. And here you can see the large particles, fine particles, large particles, fine particles, large, fine, large, fine, large, and the fine ones have been knocked off the top of that one. But this is a turbidite. This is just an example of a deposit of from a underwater landslide called the turbidity current. And that turbidity current is what carves out the canyons that we find, those submarine canyons that we find cross-cutting many continental margins. Okay, if we take a look again, go back to uh, some of our plate tectonic figures, this is figure 3.9, although I didn't mention it at the time, as this plate is thrust underneath this plate, so in the process of subduction, and this is an example of oceanic, oceanic subduction, those sediments that have accumulated on the plate on its travel from its oceanic ridge to the subduction zone, those sediments get sloughed off. They're just scraped off and they form what are called accretionary wedges. And that's not a word that I'm going to expect you to uh, know other than just knowing what it is. Um, but it's really the result of sediments getting scraped off the plate that's being subducted. And these sediment deposits can get quite extensive and can really um, have some really interesting geologic properties that we're not going to go into, but you should just be aware that they occur. Now, as material is weathered, either through rain or earthquakes or human activities, it's transported into the ocean. And as it's transported in the ocean, it begins to sink. And as it sinks, it begins to interact with seawater and may alter some of its chemical properties. It may even uh, interact with organisms, organisms that cement it together. And eventually it's deposited on the seafloor where it's buried. And once it becomes buried under sufficient amount of material, so, so there's material down here is uh, laying over by other material, it really compresses it and causes it to form rock. So buried sediments can become rock through this process called 
lithification, that rock can then be spread one way or the other as a result of seafloor spreading. And I didn't show it here in this figure, but eventually that material can be subducted and recycled. Now, biological activity can do the same thing. Sediments form from organisms, biogenesis can be eaten or they can aggregate together, they can be moved up and down, they can sink, they can be transformed. So all these different things can happen biologically and again we're going to go into a lot more detail on this next week and they can be buried and turned into rock and then through the process of seafloor spreading eventually recycled back into the crust and these materials come up again. So the point in, in these two figures here is just to illustrate that there's a sediment cycle, that sediments that get produced on land or even in the ocean eventually make their way down to the seafloor where they become rock and that material is then recycled. This takes millions of years. So it's not something that happens overnight, but it is part of the process that shapes the seafloor. And here we'll get into this figure. This is figure 515. All the different kinds of biological activities that create material that ends up on the seafloor and really kind of gives it sort of a softness. Um, those fluffy muds and sediments that uh, you often see in those pictures of abyssal plains or even in shallow pictures um, are largely formed from biological processes. And in fact, half the material we find at the very bottom of the ocean comes from biological activity. So we don't want to ignore the biology here because it's equally important as the geology, again, in shaping the seafloor. Here's one type of organism that we'll encounter in our next chapter. This is a foraminiferin. It is kind of like a protozoan with a shell, and this is its shell. Its shell has different chambers. That shell is made out of calcium carbonate. So again, calcium carbonate is a component of limestone or shells. Most of you should be familiar with at least clam shells. So this is a same kind of material that this organism uses. It has these spines that help it to collect little bits of food. And these things are very numerous in the world ocean. And eventually they die and their shells go down to the bottom of the ocean, creating carbonate sediments. And just to sort of round it out, end it out here, this is the kind of material that you find on the seafloor in different places. This happens to be the seafloor Monterey Bay. So it gives us kind of an example of what the bottom of the ocean looks like and how this really rich carpet of um, organic material provides food for something like a sea cucumber. Well, just to sort of summarize, as I said before, we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the seafloor of the ocean. The extreme conditions in this environment limit our accessibility to it and our ability to understand it. Of course, the seafloor and the things living in it hold great promise in terms of natural resources, in terms of our understanding of how the ocean works, potentially housing um, places to live, but also medicines and all sorts of things that may be useful to us, um, maybe not just in a sort of practical sense, but aesthetically as well. And as the song goes, we've only just begun to explore the world ocean. Well, of course, you want to know more about it, there are some activities at the end of the chapter in chapter four. I'd also uh, encourage you to visit the course, the textbook website, as well as some of the websites that I've linked in your course website, in the CE6 website. There's some really useful links for seafloor features and plate tectonics there. And then I'd also encourage you to watch this new Blue Planet series video, fairly new, called The Deep. It's really an outstanding look at the seafloor and the things that we just talked about in our lecture here. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please email me. I'd love to hear from you. Have a great day.